thank, thank you, Claudia, and thank you, everyone, for coming here tonight. And thank you very much to those that put this meeting together at only a week's notice. They worked incredibly hard at it, leafleting and getting the word out. So a round of applause to all those that worked on getting this meeting together. You. you know who you are. <laughs> Asima and Sector Bruce and many, many more indeed. And also I think we owe a big thank you to the mosque not just for hosting tonight's meetings but for the way in which they have always opened their doors to any organisation that wants to hold an event here. They're very much part of the community. And I see my friend, the Reverend Stephen Coles in the audience, he will attest to the work they do in the Faith Forum and with so many other communities across Islington. So a big thank you to the mosque and we will be there supporting them in this issue they're having with the uh, HSBC Bank at the moment and also what caring people, they're taking water around to the entire audience. Thank you very much indeed. This is a community meeting, it's a united meeting, it's uh, enormous, it's got its diversity, it's got its strength. And what brings us here? Utter revulsion at what has happened over the past 26 days, where nearly 2,000 people have been killed in Gaza, about 60 people have been killed in Israel, and as James pointed out, the equivalent of the population of almost two London boroughs have been made homeless in that time. This is not a humanitarian crisis. This is a human-made disaster by the actions of the Israeli military in bombing Gaza. And I have um, written to our Prime Minister and to the Speaker of the House of Commons asking that Parliament be recalled immediately so that the Prime Minister can answer some questions. And, and from drafting this letter, a couple of days ago, it's already, I put it on Twitter and Facebook, it's already been retweeted now nearly 500 times. And so it's gone to a very large number of people. And I don't know the total number, but a considerable number of MPs are now also writing in to the Prime Minister asking for the recall of Parliament. Because under our strange process, the Prime Minister has to request Parliament be recalled. I would have thought it ought to be that the people request Parliament be recalled, or MPs request, and it should not, it should not just be in the hands of the Prime Minister. And one of the questions I want to put to him is about the arms trade with Israel. Since 2010, the UK arms export licenses to Israel have been granted worth £42 million. That's quite a lot, but move on a bit. The dual-use export licenses, these are things that can be used for commercial or military use, was worth £8 billion last year. The government claims most of this was used for commercial equipment, mostly cryptographic software to supply Israel's mobile phone networks. Well, it's not a very big country, so that's an awful lot of money for mobile phone networks for five million people. Um, it's an astonishing amount. And um, Sir John Stanley, who is a Conservative MP and a member of the uh, Foreign Affairs Select Committee, has persistently raised questions on this and has raised them again. But we also have to ask what two UK companies, UAV Engines, are doing who supply um, components for the Hermes drones which are being used to bomb Gaza at the present time. Well done those protesters that demonstrate outside their factory in the Midlands a couple of days ago. And then you move on to the question of imports of weapons as well as exports from Israel and the close relationship there is with the military top brass moving seamlessly into each other's company to the question of the European Union. The European Union concluded an agreement called the Euromed Agreement with um, Israel which gives it a preferential trade status with Europe. In effect, it is Israel's major trading partner. Now, when a country doesn't sign up to international conventions, you have to ask questions why. When it does sign up to international law and it is found to be guilty of uh, a breach 
of the Geneva Convention for Occupying Powers when it's in breach by the use of phosphorus bombs during Operation Cast Lead in 2009, when it's in breach of an international law on collective punishment, when it's in breach of a, a law on uh, conduct of war by deliberately targeting civilians and civilian places such as schools, hospitals and mosques, then you have to ask some questions of the European Union Commission. Because the principal basis on which a EU trade agreement is made is that they respect human rights and they agree to the human rights agenda with the European Union. They have not adhered to it. They breached it time after time after time. So my question to David Cameron, if and when Parliament is recalled or when Parliament goes back in September is, not only do we want an end to the military relationship with Israel, we want a suspension of the EU-Israel trade agreement until they agree to the human rights clauses and adhere to them. But that is not enough. Now, obviously, a ceasefire is better than bombing, clearly. And one hopes that there will be no more bombing, but I'm very sceptical that it's not going to start again at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. But you cannot deal with that without looking at the four big issues that face Palestinian people. Issue one. I've been in the refugee camps in Lebanon. And I've met elderly people there. I remember distinctly talking to an old man in his mid-80s who described in the most intricate detail every last tree and house in the village he'd been evicted from in 1948. His whole life since then has been in the refugee camps at Sabra and Chantilla, um, just outside um, the capital. And uh, he wants his right to return home. His friends want their right to return home. Other Palestinian diaspora forever to be sent to the four winds and not allowed to go back to the land of their birth. There is a question there, and they should not be forgotten in this current debate and intensity as it obviously is about Gaza. The second is the question of the results of the 1967 war and um, Israel's expansion and the settlements on the West Bank. As James pointed out, and I've been many times on the West Bank, it took us six hours to get from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's not very far. We were stopped so many times over so many checkpoints and so much abuse by young Israeli soldiers of Palestinian workers trying to get from one place to another, trying to get home. And the water taken from the land, the water taken from the Jordan, fed into the settlement farms and the settlement agriculture, and uh, that is then masqueraded as Israeli produce and then appears in our shops. A very good reason why we should say to those supermarkets that stock goods that are produced from the settlements, sorry, you stock those goods, we ain't shopping with you anymore. And then, of course, that moves on to the question of the settlements and the occupation of the West Bank to the question of the Siege of Gaza. Now, the Siege of Gaza has gone on with intensity for the last seven years. There's never not been some kind of Siege of Gaza, but it's gone on with intensity for the last seven years. I've had the privilege of visiting Gaza on six occasions. I've been there in various guises, including as an election observer in 2005 and on various other visits. And I have many, many memories of it. The most telling thing I can give you is this. A very good friend of mine, Dr. Mona Farah, is the convener of the um, Gaza Mental Health Foundation. Her calculation is that more than 70% of the people of Gaza are suffering from medical stress. Not surprising when you have an overwhelmingly young population, 55% of whom are university graduates, probably the highest rate certainly in the region, if not anywhere in the world, 70% of whom are unemployed. And if you visit a school, and I've visited many schools in Gaza, sadly many of them have now been bombed, you can stand on the top floor of the school, you can look one side 
and you can see greenery, you can see a balloon in the sky, you can see a very big fence, and you see an area where nobody goes. What's that? It's the buffer zone. Was one kilometre. The buffer zone has now extended to three kilometres, and the balloons are there. Balloon, a tether balloon, is there to film anyone that gets anywhere near that fence, and they're then shot by automatic weapons, automatically discharged from that fence. Any farmer getting near, anyone chasing a sheep or a goat or a dog, gets shot because they get near to that fence. Look the other way, the other side, and you see a beach, beautiful beach, absolutely beautiful beach. Then you see. Beautiful sea, clear, beautiful blue sea. And then, a short distance out, you see Israeli naval boats shooting at any Palestinian fishing boat that goes more than three kilometres out from the shore. And then you realise these children have been brought up as educated as best they can in the UN schools, achieving a great deal. They have hopes, just like our young people in Islington do. They have hopes of achieving things in their lives. They can't work, they can't travel, they can't move. Their life is one of occupation and drone aircraft over, get overhead filming and recording their every movement. And then their homes bombed, apparently randomly, and now virtual carpet bombing that has gone on of whole areas of Gaza. Is it surprising that if you keep 1.8 million people in what David Cameron himself accepts as an open prison, there are consequences as a result of it. And so my plea is that we have to try and understand what it is like to live under occupation and have some solidarity and sympathy with those people. I went there after Operation Cast Lead in a delegation of MPs from all over Europe with Gerald Kaufman leading it and uh, a number of others there. And they took us, when we arrived, to a very sparse meal in the uh, Gaza parliament. Yes, there's a parliament building in Gaza. Parliament chamber, offices, all that kind of was. We met in the ruins of the parliament building, but they set out chairs and tables. And um, then at the end of the meal, our host got up and said, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, by the way, just for the record, every single thing you ate every chair you're sitting on, every table you're leaning on, came in through the tunnels. It was the only way of us surviving the blockade. And so when people talk about the illegality of the tunnels coming in from Egypt, that is the only way the people of Gaza have survived during the past seven years. Let's think the thing through a bit more seriously than some of our politicians seem to do. And so I just conclude with this. I was there post-Oslo as well. And I was taken by a representative of our own Department for International Development and showed a sewage system that Britain was funding and developing. Good. Fine. I was shown roads that we were building. Good. I was shown the new airport. Great. I was shown all of that. All of which was destroyed in Operation Cast Lead. They started rebuilding it again. And we paid again for it. The European Union paid again for it. And it was destroyed again. And now there's an international appeal to rebuild Gaza again. Well, I'm very happy to contribute to an international appeal to rebuild Gaza, but I do think those that have destroyed it should make a major contribution towards the rebuilding of it. But there has to be, but above all, there has to be a political solution to the whole issue. And that political solution has to come through understanding that you cannot keep a people in jail for so long and not expect consequences as a result of it. And I applaud and support those people in Israel that have demonstrated against the bombing of Gaza. I support Uri Avnery and many others because it must be quite difficult to stand up when opinion polls are showing 80-90% approving of what their government is doing. I'm not sure of those polls, but that's what's been said. And then I read, in, um, I read Martin Sherman in Jerusalem Post on the 31st of July, who goes on to say, um, as the campaign drags on, he's somewhat 
on the right in the political spectrum, I think it's fair to say. As the campaign drug drags on, with the IDF's military machine gummed up with the goo of political correctness, there is more time for Israel's antagonists to mobilize international outrage and promote punitive initiatives against Israeli institutions and individuals. And then goes on to say um, that to prevent an even more brutal and extreme successor from taking over, Gaza must be dismantled and the non-belligerent population relocated. This is the only way to protect the area from recurring rounds of death and destruction, i.e. his policy is to remove the entire population of Gaza. That is what is happening on behind, somewhere behind Netanyahu. And on the other side of it, there's the rest of us and world opinion. Our government has got to act. Governments around the world, Chile, South Africa, Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia, many, many, many more have acted, withdrawn ambassadors, suspended trade arrangements. Nave Pillay went to the UN Human Rights Council and demanded an investigation into war crimes. Britain abstained. The USA voted against. We've got a job to do politically here. Being at meetings is important. Being on demonstrations is important. Writing letters is important. Demanding peace, demanding justice, demanding change. Without justice for the Palestinian people, there can never be, there can never be, I'm finishing, I'm finishing now. There can, there can never be, there can never be peace in the region until there is justice for the Palestinian people. That is what brings us here tonight in unity. Thank you very much.